Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you're here. Doesn't that song just, just fill you up? And especially uh, with voices like that, it just um, really spills over into what uh, the Christmas season is all about. Well, this is uh, an, an interesting time of year, and I don't know if you noticed, but I certainly noticed that um, Black Friday seems to start earlier. Did you get that impression? You know, I, it's not like it starts on Friday anymore, like at O-Dark 30. It now is bleeding into Thursday and after Thanksgiving and a couple other things. You know, Walmart, Target, a lot of the other uh, retailers uh, had their doors open, the malls were open, and people were scurrying to get stuff even on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, Advent is a season that helps us to begin that process. Some people look at the Advent season as the end of the year. Actually, on the Christian calendar, Advent is the beginning of the Christian year. So we begin with the birth of Jesus. So we're not winding down. We're actually not winding up as we go forward with that. And what a great way as we look at uh, the Christmas season to be reminded about what Advent means. Uh, the, the movie, The Miracle on uh, 34th Street, is a movie we're going to use this morning to help tell a little bit of where I want to go. In fact, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be integrating in some of the uh, wonderful Christmas movies to help us uh, to tell the story. And this movie actually um, won five Academy Awards, and it was ninth out of a hundred of the uh, uh, passion films, so to speak, that brings joy to your life. In fact, uh, the whole purpose of this movie, Miracle on 34th Street, Street was to focus on two things, to focus on faith and hope. And that was really the goal that if anyone who watched the movie would, would end by thinking, wow, I have renewed faith and I have new hope. Well, Maureen O'Hare is uh, actually one of the main characters. She plays Doris. And Doris's job is, uh, as a Macy's employee, she is to make sure that she hires Santa Claus for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. That is a parade that continues to be one of the main uh, uh, anchors that gets us into the holiday season. In fact, uh, Macy's store in New York today is still the largest retailer in the world. And uh, so we know it's a, it's a great big deal. So Doris has been having some troubles hiring and making sure that she has the right Santa that's here. And, and uh, this opening scene we're going to look at is that she's uh, meeting with Fred Gailey. Fred lit our candle this morning. And uh, she's talking to Fred. And, and, and Doris is sharing a little bit about her life. And what happens in her life is that she actually, her husband left her and her, younger, and her young daughter. And so Doris is going through these feelings of abandonment. She's going through uh, kind of this uh, spin on not really sure what this Christmas season is going to be about. So she's not really feeling a lot of joy. She's not feeling a lot of hope. Uh, she certainly isn't very peaceful. And Fred Gailey, who's a local attorney, uh, he's kind of uh, romantically, wants to be romantically involved with her and would ultimately like to marry her. And she's, he's having a uh, conversation with her right now on some things uh, about how to be truthful to children. So let's watch this clip. You see, for Doris, uh, it's, it's a myth like all others, and, and she sees life in itself as, as one continuous thing that needs to be debunked. And Doris is one of those persons that, that she looks at life with great skepticism, and, and uh, her rejection of Santa Claus isn't, um, uh, isn't what we might think. In fact, her rejection of Santa Claus in that scene in the whole movie comes from the point that she's dealing with the abandonment, the rejection, and all the things that happen. So she's looking at life, as I said earlier, very skeptical. She's lost faith in what she considers the silly things like Santa Claus and the, the good things of Christmas as to what that might bring. But she's also lost what I'll call some of the intangibles. She's lost faith and she's lost hope. She's lost uh, peace and she's lost joy. And she's lost some of those significant anchors that, that, that bind us together when it comes to our faith walk and, and, and what we have for life. So for Doris, whatever doesn't fit her direction of thinking, whatever she can't prove intellectually is, is false. And she's having some great challenges with that. Uh, kind of an underlying tone of what's happening with this movie is what philosophers call by the word epistemology. Epistemology is why do we believe the things that we believe and, and, and what surrounds our understanding of that. So from an epistemological, boy, I really got that out right. From an epistemological uh, I'm going to say that one more time. That's kind of fun. Epistemological point of view that uh, you, you, you would prove things or you would, you would get to that point. Some would say it's kind of like that left brain, right brain thinking. Have you ever heard that before? 
Um, they actually debunked that and said that left brain and right brain thinkers are, uh, it's not really what a person's personality is. For a long time, we thought that. But, but there is some significance in left brain and right brain thinking. For instance, a left brain thinker is someone who deals less with emotion, someone who deals more with facts, someone who deals with <clears throat> the intellectual things, someone who deals with the theories and likes to uh, work things out that way. That's, a, that's the left brain thinker, logical, uh, comes to conclusions through logic, being able to prove things. Uh, I can be a little bit like that at times. Uh, the, the right brain thinker is the opposite of that. And the right brain thinker is the person who, who basically looks at life and deals with decisions upon what's going on in their heart. It's not about head, but it's about heart. So a right brain thinker is probably into the arts, uh, is, is intuitive, is, is uh, playful, is someone that uh, uh, sees life in a different kind of way. And, and they say that sometimes marriages, opposites will attract. So thinking about Doris and her struggles, do you think Doris is right-brained or left-brained? And the congregation said left-brained. Yeah, so let me, let, let me ask you a question here this morning. How many of you are kind of the scientific thinker? I need facts, I need figures, prove it, logic. How many of you are that way? There's like three of you. Okay, so the rest of you are right brain thinkers. You, you go by feeling and emotion and you don't decide things by head, but you do it more, more by heart. So that, that's kind of where, where we find the situation here and the challenges that, that come from that. So Doris is, is a left brain thinker. And, and the challenge that we find out that she's having here, like a lot of us have, is when it comes to a feeling of like of an emotion called love. And, and love is actually a chemical that's triggered in the brain and it releases a chemical called oxytocin. And oxytocin is released into the brain. Some would say when you eat chocolate, that, that you get that woo feeling and it's that euphoria that comes from that. That's the oxytocin that, that is released into your blood. So from a logical thinker, they have a hard time saying how love can be like a love that endears all things or someone who's willing to give up their life for another because they love them. A, a logical um, left brain thinker might have trouble with that, but a right brain person could say, well, it makes total sense. And that's the, the kind of thing that we see. So, so God has given us both halves of the brain. And with that, hopefully we become in times the, the middle thinker to where we can see and, and connect with the things that are there. So logic and common sense come into play with these things. And especially as we look at the Christmas story, your logic and common sense. Logic and common sense would say, did a virgin really give birth to a child? Logic and common sense would say, there's no way. Logic and common sense would say, did God who is the celestial being, who is ethereal, but who is of all things, did God really come in the flesh and leave his greatness and vastness of his throne and come into this broken down sinful world and begin to minister to us as Jesus the Christ? Uh, well, a logical approach would say, there, there's no way that would happen. In fact, it's far-fetched. But epistemology comes in that point and says, but we believe what we believe because there's a foundation to the things that are there. Now, let's, let's kind of switch stories here for a second because this gets into the second leg of where I wanna head for this message. So logic and understanding versus feeling of heart in those things when it comes to the Christmas story. In this movie, we find a character named Kris Kringle. And Chris Kringle makes it very clear that he is Santa Claus. If you've seen this movie, uh, you, you know the scenes that they're probably we're gonna see this morning. But he builds this up and he believes that he's Santa Claus. And Maureen O'Hara's character, Doris, hires him to be Santa. So the scene that we're gonna see here now is that, that Santa or Chris Kringle is being coached as to how to be a good Santa Claus for the Christmas season. You see what's happening here? Chris Kringle is really rejecting the whole commercialization of the Christmas season. He thinks that Christmas needs to be something more than just the commercial aspects of that. And we'll see that develop as, as he actually reminds us of what faith and hope are all about. Do you also notice that what he does is he takes a stand and he's unwilling to yield on the fact of making others do something that they probably don't wanna do, like forcing young children, as he says, to, buy, uh, to have their parents buy toys that they don't want. So we see this great battle that's going on with this part here, and all of a sudden it's coming to a head as we begin to see. But Chris, if you've watched the movie, you find out that he comes up with this brilliant idea. 
And that idea is that, that to recommend other places to buy the toys if Macy's doesn't have that. And Mr. Macy ends up seeing what a great way it is that this man has now renewed the vigor of the store and has brought great things in. But very quickly, Doris learns that Chris actually thinks he is Santa Claus. And she's not real sure how to deal with that. So she hooks him up with Dr. Sawyer, the company psychologist. And Dr. Sawyer is going to move him through a process of understanding, is he who he says he really is? So let's watch this clip here. See, Dr. Sawyer's like people that we know. He can't stand when someone challenges their way of looking at what they think reality is in life. And very quickly, the conversation goes from having a conversation to kind of just shutting it down and pushing you out of the way. And Chris learns that really what's going on with Dr. Sawyer is a lot of what's happening with Doris, insecurities that he's experiencing in life and the challenges of the things that are before him. But what we learn from this exchange in these two is that Chris is bent on standing for to the identity that he says that he has. Now, I want to remind you of a man who did the same thing. His name was Jesus. In fact, Jesus came into the world and he said, I've come into the world for a greater purpose. I've come into the world to the ransom many and to reconcile the world back into the Father's hands. And that was the point of that. And how did people treat that when Jesus said that he was the Messiah? They didn't like that, did they? In fact, they tried to quiet his story and ultimately it led him to the cross where he was killed. But the bigger picture of the things that we see is the greater good that comes when we sense the, the way of salvation. We also learn in this story of, of Chris is that, that things don't go as well as, as expected. And he begins to find himself placed in, um, in Bellevue Hospital where he is now being looked at as being a person who is not of rational mind. The challenges that come from that now is that Fred Gailey takes up his case to be his lawyer. And Fred and Doris are now engaging in a conversation where Doris is looking at logic and reality and Fred is looking at more of what the heart might say and how to stand up for someone who may not be able to stand up for themselves. So let's take a look at, at this clip here. To Doris, Fred is uh, going after this idealistic binge. He's left his job, he's left his career, he's left everything he's known for this unknown that's out there. And to come to the defense of a, of a man that he thinks, is, or that she thinks is crazy, who's proclaiming an identity that maybe isn't his own. But I love what, I love what Fred says to Doris, and, and this is perfect here. He says, someday you're gonna find out that your way of facing this realistic world just doesn't work. When you do, don't overlook those lovely intangibles you'll discover that, they're, they're, that they are the only things that are worthwhile. What Fred is saying that is he's saying the same thing to us, that sometimes we look at the world as being very idealistic. We look at the world as being that it has to be a certain way. We look for the proof for everything that's there. And by doing that, we miss the sightings of God. We miss the perspectives. We miss those little moments when God reveals himself to us in a powerful way and makes the difference. And what we miss with that are the things of love and hope and peace and joy. Because without looking at life the way that we should, we're looking for answers that we may not find. I wonder, I wonder if, if you've kind of figured it out yet that this is really the whole roundabout of what epistemology is. That we've come full circle to this place. Why do we believe or why is it that we think the way that we do and how? And I think about, you know, the writer of Hebrews who said this. The writer says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I thought about my life sometimes, about how, how I can be so idealistic in a point where, where I become like Missouri. It needs to be a prove it to me. I need more data or I need to understand it better or I need to know how it works to dissect it or that logic needs to be there. And I'm unwilling at times to bend and yield solely on that faith part because I need to know that I know what the answer is. But the writer of Hebrews says we must be careful with that that having faith should precede all and there's, there's a number that we should believe in advance of even having the proof of anything at all. 
in the sense of that. It takes us forward to a next season that we're gonna come to in the life of the church called Easter, where none of us can prove the resurrection. None of us can prove anything that happened that day with regard to, to Jesus' body being removed from the tomb without being seen, without him being seen by others and, and the, the aspects of that res resurrection. And yet our faith tells us to believe. So therefore our belief through faith precedes the knowledge of the things that we have. The climax of this film this morning comes into the courtroom scene where Fred Gailey gives it his all to make sure that he represents Chris in the most powerful way. And in doing so, the proof needs to be that someone can prove that Chris is who he says that he is. And we begin to look at some challenges going on here. Fred calls some key witnesses. He calls the son of the uh, prosecutor who points out that yes, Chris Kringle is Santa Claus. He pulls Mr. Macy into the room. Do you believe? He says, yes, I do. And yet the court isn't really sure until Fred does this. Now, there's a great deal of this film that obviously I'm not gonna show you today, and I hope that you'll go and you'll watch this for the sole reason that through this experience of what we see through the script of The Miracle on 34th Street, it really does renew our faith in having to believe in things that we don't know, things that we can't see. But the greater good is it doesn't just focus on Santa Claus. It focuses on deeper things, deeper things of our faith, deeper things of our hope, bringing us closer to the Christ child who brought us to here. And please, I didn't bring you to church today just to talk about Santa Claus, but I wanted to connect a dot here that's very important. We, we understand Chris Kringle in the name of that, but where did the name Chris King Kringle come? And, and what is it that we know? Well, in the fourth century, there actually was a Bishop of Myra. His name uh, was uh, was. Uh, you know, uh, Nicholas, St. Nicholas. And Nicholas as a boy became orphaned at a young age where his parents left all of their wealth to their young son. And as he grew, he began to figure out that he didn't want anything to do with the money and the wealth that they left him. And he went out on a life's mission back in the fourth century and he began to give away every dollar and every dime that his parents had ever given to him. And he gave it to those that were poor, those that were in need, those who couldn't pay their bills, those who didn't have food, those who needed shelter. He poured out his entire life for that and kept nothing for himself. Martin Luther, the great reformer of the Protestant Reformation, came back and looked at that and said, well, there's gotta be something greater than, than St. Nicholas of Myra. And Martin Luther said, it really goes more into what the Germans call uh, Kistkundel. And Kistkundel means Christ child in German. And Luther said, it's more of that when we take on these attributes of emptying ourselves, and when we give that which we have away to others, especially those who are in need, those who are poor, those who cannot help themselves, we become the Christ child. We become the light to the world. And we become the identity of Jesus who was born that day. Yes, God was the one who made it all possible. And the story of Christmas does focus on this one thing, that God chose to come into the world in human flesh. He was birthed through the womb of Mary, who was a virgin, and through that became raised and taught and led people to understand the significance and the foundations of the faith that God the Father in heaven of all creation, but demonstrated through his life and through his sacrifice, the greatest gift of all, which was the gift of salvation to those who believe. And we find out through that story that, that it started with humble beginnings, that this baby was born in poverty, in a stable, that Jesus did not come into the world as the Messiah as many had thought, as many had hoped. He did not come into the world as a warrior, but he came as a savior, a gentle spirit, and a king. The miracle in the movie uh, on 34th Street is that a kind old man helps to remind us of what it means to have faith, helps to remind us what it means to have hope. And the storyline behind Doris was that she could shake the shackles of her misguided and her tragic life and she could once again laugh. She could once again embrace the truth of what God had placed in her, that she could transform her mind from being one who was solely bent on understanding the identity of God through logic and knowledge and proof, and instead could believe now in the intangibles, that through her heart, the heart given to her by God himself, could understand the importance of faith, hope, 
love, and peace. You know, a great thing has, has happened as we think about um, this season. And as followers of Christ and as, as followers of the Christ child, as you and I live into the words kiss kundal, as we become that person in the world, it reminds us that we have a role, that our role is not simply to think of ourselves, but that our role is much greater than that. And we are to reach out and we are to bring hope, joy, peace, and love to all who are near. I'd like to remind you that one of the parables that Jesus said that uh, should have great emphasis on us as Christians is found in Matthew 25. Jesus said these words, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. He also talked about cloaks. He talked about shelter. He said that when I was in prison, you came and visited me. Folks, this isn't what the, what the world teaches. This is what God teaches. And this is who we are to become. We are to live into that. We are to find those opportunities in our community and in our world where we can be kiskundal, Christ child, to all who come near. This past week, over 70 of you showed up here and helped deliver over 340 turkeys and dinners to, to uh, households. In fact, if we were to multiply that as the number that we gave out, that probably is roughly about 1,000 people that were fed through that opportunity of our open arms ministry. And through the help of all that you have brought and by the way in which you gave your life into reaching into that, great significance has happened in the things that we see. As we approach the uh, celebration of the, of the birth of Christ, I think we're to remember these things. I think we're to remember what it means to empty ourselves and to take on the image of Christ and to go into the world. As we did last year, I'm issuing another challenge this year. And that is that I, I want to ask our congregation, not only those who worship here in Largo, Florida, but those that worship via live streaming as well, I issue this challenge to you. I want you to figure out how much money you spend on gifts for your family. And I'd like you to bring a portion of what you spend on your family to our Christmas Eve service to be a part of our offering that night. What are we gonna do with those funds? There's a couple of things that we're, we're gonna do with those funds. Part of those funds are gonna go back into our community to help those who are struggling. I'm not gonna use the term poor because that can, that can be a, 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 a term that can tear down someone's life. I'm gonna say those that are challenged right now, those that are having difficulties, it'll go to, to those that we can partner with. It'll also go to some of our partner schools where we can help make a difference. But also another portion of that offering that night, we're gonna to dedicate to relief of malaria. And malaria is a disease that causes uh, tremendous issues, not only uh, to, to adults, but more importantly, uh, to, to little children. <clears throat> As every 60 seconds, a child in Africa dies uh, by malaria. The sad part about it is most of these children are stricken as they sleep at night. They're in uncovered places. They're, in, they're living in shanties. They're living outside. They're living in horrible conditions. And because they're unprotected, the mosquito, which is carrying the malaria bug, bites them and injects them with this horrible disease. Part of that Christmas Eve offering will go that we will partner with other United Methodist churches and uh, the No More Malaria Initiative that globally, we as a United Methodist Church can make a difference with millions and millions and millions of dollars. And through that, the goal is that if not tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Africans can uh, be saved through the, through the uh, purchase of, um, of nets, mosquito netting, drugs for the disease and things from there. So see, your sacrifice makes a difference. Your sacrifice in being kissed kundal, Christ child into the world, will renew hope and faith to those who are in need. But it's an invitation, and an invitation will only happen if someone accepts that. Another invitation I wanna to give to you this Christmas season is right out these doors into our lobby and in some of our other facilities, you'll find our annual Christmas tree. And on that, you'll find an ornament. And I wanna encourage you to take as many as you can and help us to produce faith and hope and joy and love and peace in households that have nothing this Christmas season. St. Paul has been a tremendous uh, uh, force in helping that happen every year. And I know this year you'll do the same. So we begin that as well today. Opportunities abound for us to be the light of Christ in the world. My hope is that this Christmas season, 
that we'll not only just see the miracle on 34th Street, but we'll see that that miracle on 34th Street moves its way to 1199 Highland Avenue in Largo, Florida, right here. And not only here at 1199 uh, uh, Highland Avenue in Largo, Florida, but into your homes, into your businesses, into our community and into the world. And folks, by that, we can make a difference. My prayer is that this season would bring you hope, bring you faith, bring you joy, love, 